you on your toes, but sometimes you just wonder if the enemy is out there trying to, yep, distract us, cause us to not think about those things that, that God wants us to think about. Um, but this morning, the, the message that the Lord has laid on my heart is going to carry us through the scriptures quite a bit. So, um, and one of those wonderful things, you know, that the, the enemy does, you know, uh, as I was preparing this message, it seemed like I was going to try to do a PowerPoint, but every time I tried to get everything worked out, it didn't work right. So, um, so I don't have that. So maybe that was just going to be a distraction. So I trust God in all of this. Um, but as he, he led me through the scripture this week, I pictured a thread because, um, you know, everything from the Old Testament to the New Testament is connected. And, um, and so he carried me, and, he, and he's going to carry us this morning, uh, from Matthew to Isaiah and back to Matthew and to 1 Corinthians and then to Jonah and to Matthew again. And, uh, but just like a dot-to-dot -dot works, you know? those things that we used to do as kids and we began connecting the dots once you start connecting those dots and you see that picture more clearly and so my prayer today is Lord as I share this revelation may our eyes see you and perceive your message may our ears hear your teaching to us with understanding and may our hearts be open to your word and your call and your leading in our lives so today, as we begin, let me take you to Matthew, the Matthew connection. And in Matthew um, chapter 13, it's kind of ironic that he took me here because I was like, Lord, I've preached on this before. I don't think they want to hear another sermon on sowing seeds. Um, but I kept reading and and one of the things they teach us is to not just read one scripture. You know, you, re re you continue reading because everything is connected and you read the chapter after and you read the chapter before and you begin to pray that God will give you understanding. And, and so today, as we read the parable of the sower, remember that this is really not the message. That same day in chapter 13 of Matthew, it says, that same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him and that he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seeds. As he was scattering the seeds, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. He who has ears, let him hear. Now, this is the parable of the sower. And this is a familiar parable to most of us. We've heard this in some way or fashion through the years. Some of you may have heard it at times and even thought this is a great revelation by Jesus on the kingdom. But where I want to take you is on past that. If you'll continue with me. In verse 10, the disciples came to him and asked, why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. This is a good question the disciples had. Why did he speak in, in parables? Because, you know, he could have just said what he wanted to say and been really plainly about it. You know, every Sunday morning we come in here and we hear a message from God. And I love Brother James. He always has something in his little bag of goodies or tricks, you know, to show us, and it helps it stick with us. And I do that a lot in children's ministry, and Titus does that in youth ministry because we're trying to get the message to stick. We could just come in and say, you know, probably 
five minutes worth of truth to you really plainly and we could just stop at that but he basically shares that he speaks in parables this is what Jesus says basically for a deeper understanding for those that can truly see and hear God's kingdom messages for those that can't it doesn't really matter that's the sad part I think it really doesn't make a difference how he would speak because if, if he spoke the truth plainly or if he spoke in parables, if their eyes aren't open and their ears aren't open and their hearts aren't ready to hear, if they've closed all those things, then they can't hear the message anyway, whether it's in a parable or it's the plain truth. See, he created each of us with free will. And only when we surrender our hearts and lives to God can we see with God's eyes and hear with God's ears and understand with God's heart that takes us to the Genesis connection but we won't go all the way there Jesus then shares with his disciples the Isaiah connection this is why I speak to them in parables those seeing they do not see Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. This is Isaiah's prophecy that he received. In them is fulfilled this prophecy. After I was reading this, I thought about who the crowd might have been that day. Who was Jesus talking about? Well, he's there, it says, a large crowd was there wanting to know who he is and what he's really talking about. What he can do for them. Also in the crowd, if you look at the chapter before, is the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. The church people were there, too. His family members were there. They wanted to be close to him. They were like, we're, tell him we're here. But all of these people that were hearing him were not truly understanding. Maybe it's because they didn't like the message. Or if it really means what they think it means. Sometimes when we hear the message, if it, it's really what we think it means, what Jesus is trying to tell us, mm, that means we might have to change the way we already do things. We, we kind of are in their place this morning. We want to hear from God. How many of you came this morning hoping to hear from God? Maybe we want something from him. Maybe we feel the emptiness. Or maybe we just have a, a plan. We're, we're a church person. We're a Christian. We have a plan. We have a checklist. One of the things that we do is we go to church. And I check it off my list. We may be one of those blind people coming to just touch a piece of his garment to be healed. A beggar, a teacher of the law, trying to understand. Jesus says to his, to his disciples, The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. And as I read that, I thought, because? You know, so how do you get that knowledge? I want that knowledge. Don't you, don't you want that knowledge? I mean, I want that, that understanding. I want to be like the disciples. I said it, I said it earlier, though. It comes from surrendering our will to him, our heart to him, our life to him. And as I, 
I thought about that. Well, how can I share that with you guys? How can you understand that? And that takes us to 1 Corinthians. If you can go there with me. 1 Corinthians. It's in the New Testament. I know you're flipping. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And he speaks. Paul speaks here to help us understand this. Paul says, when I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with the demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. We do, not, we do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed it to us by his spirit. That's how we know. The spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except for the spirit of God. We have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual man makes judgments about all things, but he himself is not subject to any man's judgment. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ? Paul first tells us we need this knowledge, Jesus Christ and him crucified, that he died for us. He died for each of us. That atonement right there. Wisdom doesn't come from man but from God. We can learn a lot of things. We can have all kinds of degrees. But wisdom, true wisdom, comes from God. Paul shares this in this chapter, and it just blows my mind. When I read this chapter, I'm just blown away by the deepness of it, and yet it's so simple. We have the mind of Christ, and it reveals the wisdom of the kingdom to us. I could probably stop right here. And this would be a good day. We could just relish in this chapter right here. You could just go home and study this and just let it fill you in the knowledge and wisdom of Christ. But he has more for us this morning. If we go back to Matthew in chapter 13. Isaiah was not one of those prophets that Jesus talks about here. Because he says, But blessed are your eyes. This is what he tells his disciples in chapter 13, verse 16. But blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. For I tell you the truth, many prophets and righteous men long to see what you see, but did not see it. And to hear what you hear but did not hear it. Isaiah was a prophet that God revealed those revelations to. And he had received, received this revelation, this part. One of the things about Isaiah is that he is 
the most quoted prophet in the New Testament, the most connected of the thread. And as we study this and we encounter this, Jesus himself quotes Isaiah when he comes forth in the, in the temple that day to begin his ministry. But Isaiah is overwhelmed because God reveals himself to him in chapter 6. If you'll go with me to Isaiah in the Old Testament. And in chapter 6, this is where this verse that Jesus shares is. And he has encountered God and is so overwhelmed by God that when he prophesied all of these things, it not only affected the people of his day, Isaiah, but it affected all the way through history of Israel and in Jesus' day and even in our day today. Let's hear what Isaiah shares in, in chapter 6. He begins, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, angels. That's what seraphs are. Each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am. Send me. Now I want to tell you a little bit about Uzziah. I guess this is the teacher in me. i got to share. But as I study all of this, I, I want you to understand. It says that this is the year that King Uzziah died. That's how Isaiah starts this. And that was approximately 740 years before Christ came. He had become king at the age of 16 in Jerusalem. Can you imagine some of you 16-year-olds out there or close to it being king of Israel at your age? But he followed God and he honored God in all that he did, and God showed favor on him. And he did for God and Israel what he should do as a king. But Uzziah allowed pride to come into his life. And he decides one day that he didn't need to follow God's rules in the way that he had mandated and set up the temple rules. And so he decides he's going to go in and burn the incense instead of the priests. And so he goes to the temple, and as he begins to do this, the group of priests there, they say, you know, you shouldn't do this. This is not right. And Uzziah gets angry and allows pride to take over and God strikes him with leprosy. And so, he, for the remainder of his life, he's isolated from everyone. Because that's what happens when you get leprosy. You're isolated. And I share this because I want us to think about Isaiah's mindset. I really thought about this a lot. Because it says, this is the, this is the year that King Uzziah died. And, and this is when he encounters God. And I don't know for sure, but as I thought about it, I thought about Isaiah being a descendant of Aaron. He's a Levite priest. He's working in the temple in service for the Lord. 
And they had all these different duties that they had to do. And he was probably working there. And, and don't you think that they probably talked about it all the time? I mean, he had already encountered these priests, Uzziah did. And so you think about it. You think about our community. And Isaiah was probably so sick and tired of hearing about all that, you know, what if, why did he do this? And what if he should have done this? And if he had done this? And, and dealing with understanding this king that they, they probably had pride in, that they took favor in, and God had taken favor in him. And, and why did he allow this to happen? Why did he make those mistakes? We all do that. And as they're trying to judge all of that and get all of that straightened out in his mind, I wonder if Isaiah was living with the doubts of his leader and his king. If, if he, a follower of God, can let pride take that over, and who am I? What am I? You know, and, and who is God in, in all of this? Those same questions that we all deal with in life. We probably deal with that every morning when we wake up and we hear the news. And we put our, our stock or our, our faith in men. But we, we can't do that. We have to put our, our stock and in, in faith in God. And so... I wonder if Isaiah was trying to figure all that out and where do I put my faith and how do I truly believe in all of this and, and as he's busy doing the temple's church stuff, the everyday, he has this supernatural encounter with God. He has this vision of God seated on his throne with the angels crying out, holy, holy, holy. And the train of his robe, it says, it filled the whole temple. And Isaiah has this vision of God, his whole presence filling the temple, his temple. And that right there is a message in itself of God filling the temple. Because, guys, we're the temple now. And God wants to fill the entire temple. And in the presence of God, Isaiah realizes who he is and humbles himself before God. I don't know about you, but even this morning as we worship God, I think to myself, who am I? I am a woman of unclean lips. We are a people of unclean lips. And that's where Isaiah was. And if you really think about it, here is this priest, ceremonially clean. Okay, he's done all the things that he's humanly supposed to do. Followed all of the right things that he's supposed to do. So he should be able to stand. He, you know, at least he didn't have that fear of when he went in that he'd get struck down and die. You know, they would tie the rope around the priest so they could pull him back out, you know, <laughs> in case they died. But he's ceremonially clean, but yet, in the presence of a holy God, he says, I am a man of unclean lips. Isaiah, standing for God, has a repentative heart. And the thread and the connection of everything that we're talking about this morning, one of the things I want you to, to catch is the thread of repentance. You see, Jesus was telling this parable of the sower. And unless we have that surrendered heart, that repentative heart, the seed's not going to stick. And so there's Isaiah encountering a holy God. And in the face of God's holiness, he realizes how unworthy he truly is. 
and repent. And then the angel comes with the coal. And that represents atonement. And in the Jewish faith, that altar, that was the altar of atonement. And that coal that that angel took and touched Isaiah's mouth with, that was atonement. That's what Jesus did for each of us. Because none of us are worthy. And one day we'll all stand before God. Not because we're worthy, but because of the atonement, the blood of the Lamb. And it brings purification when there's a repentative heart. And then, what comes next? God says, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? See, God doesn't atone us to stay here and just serve in the temple or to make sure our house is in order. But he atones us and purifies us to be used for him. Isaiah says, Lord, send me. This is what Jesus refers to in Matthew. That connection of his disciples. Blessed are you because you hear and you see and you understand. But those messages that he, that he shares, that Jesus shared, that God gives Isaiah, it's on further down. Isaiah experiences a holy God and a call. And he says, okay, God, I'm going to go. I'm going to give I'm going to give the message. What's what's the message, Lord? Give it to me. And here's the message. Be ever hearing but never understanding. Be ever seeing but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. How sad. How hard that must have been to hear that message. I don't know if you get it, but the message is to tell them, sorry, you're not going to hear you're not going to see. You're not going to understand. And then Isaiah says, how long, Lord? And then he answers, until the cities are in ruins and without inhabitant, until the houses are left and deserted and the fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone far away and the land is utterly forsaken. And though a tenth remains in the land, it will again be laid waste. But as the terebinth and oak leave stumps when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. Isaiah experiences the holiness of God, humbles his heart, repents, is cleansed by God, then called by God and accepts this call, and then God gives him a message not good news when we want to share the message we want to share good news Dan and Michelle were here this morning baby Evelyn Claire if you haven't seen her you need to go see her she's here that's good news you want to share that you don't want to share the bad news that doesn't get you excited to share.
But the one cool thing is, is that even though that message for Isaiah to give to Israel wasn't good news, he left a glimmer of hope. I don't know if he caught it there at the end. My question to you this morning. Do you want to be a stump? Stumps aren't very cool. I know we have one kind of out by the fire pit that that was kind of cool. It's kind of rotten now, but (laughs) because you could still kind of sit on it, you know. But God gives that glimmer of hope to Isaiah. That even though all of this destruction is going to happen, a stump is going to remain. The root, the holy seed. And that's the Matthew connection. Blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. For I tell you the truth, many prophets and righteous men long to see what you see but did not see it and hear what you hear but did not hear it. They were holy seed. The disciples are holy seed. They're stumps. And they're going to continue the message. They're going to bring that kingdom message I know it's not pretty, but guess what? You're a stump. You're not like the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who had just asked him in the chapter before. They come to him, and what do they want? A miraculous sign. We want a miraculous sign so we can believe in you. But he tells them, He tells them that the only miraculous sign you're going to get is that like the sign of Jonah. It's really cool how God connects all of that. When you were a kid and you heard the story of Jonah, did you ever think about it was a a foreshadow of what Christ was going to endure? But Jesus foretells that. How many nights was... Jonah in the belly of the well? Three. How many was Jesus in the belly of the earth? Three. And so Jesus tells them, that's the only sign you're going to get. But in the day of judgment, the Ninevites are going to stand up. They repented. They had a repentive heart. But they're going to tell you You're unworthy because it's not about what we do or what we can we can do for for God it's about a repentive heart if we want to be a stump if we want to be that holy seed We have to have that repentive heart. This morning, let's stand. This morning, if you you want to be like the remnant of Israel, that root that remained, that still truly believed, that repented to God and trusted Him. Or like the Ninevites, when they heard God's message from Jonah, it says that they repented. They put on sackcloth and ashes, and they prayed and they fasted and they repented. They didn't wait till... Maybe tomorrow we'll change what we're doing in our lives. They heard the message and they changed right then. If we want to be like the disciples, even though we 
we think we might not understand, we go to God and we, we search for him. We seek him out. We ask him, help us to understand, Lord. We want, we want to know you. We want to understand how to be a stump. And this morning we stand before a holy God. We're in his presence just like Isaiah stood with unclean lips. We are a people of unclean lips, but we can repent with our whole hearts and accept his atonement. In God's presence this morning, I don't want to be ever hearing and never understanding. I want to perceive. I want to see. I want to hear. I don't want to have a calloused heart. Do you want his wisdom? Do you want his heart? Do you want his mind? Do you want to be a stump for Jesus? Do you want to be part of his holy seed? I know that this message isn't a very popular one. One of repentance. But that's what we need for healing, for this land, for our hearts. And remember the First Corinthians connection, guys. It's not about physical healing. It's not about everything being perfect in our lives. It's about spiritual healing and knowing that if everything in this world falls apart and all our limbs are cut down that we're still deeply rooted in God and we're still a stump this morning are you serious about are you serious about what you came here To hear from God. And God's message is repentance. Not tomorrow, but today. Because if we repent, as Isaiah did, and we accept his, the atonement of Jesus, then we can't just start tomorrow as usual. Because God has a call on our life. He wants us to be his stumps and to be his holy seed and to speak for him and to speak his truth and to shine his light. Let us pray. Dear Lord, this morning as we come before you, there's no music playing. But there's you and there's us. And you are a holy God. And we are a people of unclean lips. And Lord, I don't know where each of us are. But I pray right now that those hearts that have a heart of repentance before you this morning, Lord, that you would cleanse us, that you would purify us, that you would touch our mouths, our lips, with coal of your atonement, your sacrifice, with the blood of the Lamb that was shed for each of us. And this morning, Lord, as we stand before you and you cry out, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Lord, that we would stand before you and say, Lord, send me. 
you know which heart that would say, Lord, send me. I'm going to trust in you. I'm going to be deeply rooted in you, Lord. I want to be a stump for you. Change my life. May tomorrow be different, Lord. As I encounter those in my life, Lord, that I would say, repent. For his kingdom is here. Help us, Lord, to not let anyone go astray. Help us to have your eyes to see those that are lost, that need you and need your repentance. Help us, Lord, to be your holy seed. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.